Tonight, calm returns to Sokoto metropolis as Governor Aminu Tambua orders 24-hour curfew following Muslim youth protests for the release of two arrested in connection with the killing of a female student for alleged blasphemy. Catholic Archbishop of Sokoto Diocese, Matthew Kuka, confirms he is unhurt and safe, calls for calm and suspends all masses till curfew is lifted. Family asks for release of Leah Sharibu as she clocks 19 in captivity four years and two months after the Boko Haram terrorist group adopted her and her colleagues from the Government Girls Science and Technical College, Dapchi, Yobe State. Mayor says Ukrainian forces have pushed Russian troops far from Ukraine's second largest city. And on business news tonight, 285 exporters get approval of 375 billion Naira export expansion grant from the Federal Executive Council through the Nigeria Export Promotion Council. On sports news tonight, Liverpool wins the FA Cup trophy after a 6-5 penalty shootout win against Chelsea, their second domestic title of the season. Muslim youths in Sokoto State trooped out in their numbers earlier today in protest against those accusing them of resorting to violence and jungle justice following the death of female student Deborah Samuel for alleged blasphemy. The youths are asking the state government as well as security agencies to release those arrested in connection with the killing. Armed with placards with different inscriptions, some protesters stormed the Kanwuri which is close to the Sultanate Council and later visited the Sultan's palace, demanding the release of the suspect. A combined team of security operatives, including soldiers from the 8th Division, police, DSS, NSCDC, were stationed in strategic positions to prevent a breakdown of law and order. A 24-hour curfew is now in place within Sokoto Metropolis to curb the civil unrest experience in the state since the mob action at the Shehu Shagari College of Education. Some traders and other business owners suffered losses as hoodlums hijacked the protest and embarked on a looting spree. It also affected parts of St. Bekita Sokoto Catholic Diocese Secretariat. According to the governor, Aminu Tambuwal, this move is to restore peace and order in Sokoto Metropolis as well as the entire state. I hereby declare curfew within the metropolis of Sokoto Township for the next 24 hours. I appeal to the good people of Sokoto State to kindly continue to observe law and order and calm down the restiveness that is currently pervading in the metropolis and that everyone should please, in the interest of peace, go back home and observe these measures with a view of the establishment of peace, law and order in the state. It is not in the interest of anyone for us to have a breakdown of law and order. And I therefore appeal for a strength and for people to observe and respect the rule of law. Calm is gradually returning to the Sokoto state capital after a protest that started peacefully turned violent. More details of what transpired in Sokoto today before the imposition of the curfew have emerged. According to a statement released by the Catholic Art Diocese of Sokoto, youths led by some adults in the background were said to have attacked the Holy Family Catholic Cathedral and Bishop Lawton Secretariat in addition to the Bekita Center located along Aliu Jodi Road. In a reaction, the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Matthew Kuka, confirmed that he is unhurt and safe and that his Sokoto residence has not been burnt.
He commended the governor of Sokoto State, Amin Utambua, for acting quickly by declaring the 24-hour curfew to curb the protest. Bishop Kuka also confirmed that no life has been lost and asked Christians to remain law-abiding and pray for the return of normalcy. The statement also announces that all masses in Sokoto Metropolis have been suspended until the curfew is lifted. Meanwhile, reports say the remains of the borough Samuel may have been laid to rest. The report says she was buried in her hometown of Tunga Magia in a Rau local government area of Niger State earlier today. Tears were said to have flowed freely as she was being buried as well as well wishes and relations lamented how she was killed. Meanwhile, the Kaduna state government has banned all forms of protest related to religious activities across the state. The state commissioner for internal security and home affairs, Mr. Samuel Aruwan, said in a statement that the ban, which is a with immediate effect, was done in consultation with the State Security Council. He explains that the prohibition of all forms of religious protest becomes imperative in view of moves by some unpatriotic elements to organize series of for and against protests related to a recent security development in one of the northern Nigerian states. According to the statement, Governor Nasser Erufai, who has been briefed of the development, has charged security operatives to ensure strict enforcement of this ban against any form of religious protest in the state. The statement further reveals that security agencies have resolved that any attempt by individuals or group to disrupt the peace by way of religious protests will not be tolerated, as such will be promptly halted and conveners prosecuted. In another development, it has been four years and two months since 110 schoolgirls were kidnapped by the Boko Haram terrorist group from the Government Girls Science and Technical College, Dabji Yobe State. The family of the only schoolgirl left in captivity, Ms. Leah Sharibu, is appealing to the international community to put pressure on the Nigerian government to assist in rescuing her. They made this appeal while speaking to journalists in Yola, the Adamawa state capital, as Leah marks her 19th birthday today and fifth year in captivity. The years have been rolling by since Leah Sharibu was abducted by the Boko Haram insurgents at the Government Girls Science and Technical College, Dapchi, in Yobe state. Besides the five school girls who died on the same day of the abduction, Boko Haram released everyone else in March 2018 except Leah, allegedly for her refusal to convert to Islam. Every day is a painful reminder of Leah's absence, but May 14 perhaps is harder to bear as it marks the teenager's birthday. This year, she turns 19. The family is marking her birthday with this assembly of women carrying placards with inscriptions to drive home the demand for Leah's rescue. Spokesperson of the Sharibu family, Dr. Gloria Puldu, describes her continued captivity as unfortunate despite several promises made by the Nigerian government to rescue her and other victims. Look at these women. Look at us. Look at all Nigerian women, mothers. Look at our daughters, what we are going through. As fathers, can you please do the needful? Rescue this young child. She became a woman from 14 years up till now. Leah's mother, Rebecca Sharibu, has a word of encouragement for her daughter as she continues her journey into adulthood. I will tell her, let her be encouraged up to now. We are still praying. The whole world are still praying for her. If God wish, one day she will be back. Last year, May, when Leah turned 18, Nigerian artists remembered her courage and refusal to deny her faith with her song in her honor titled Heroes of Faith. But with each passing year, it appears the advocacy for her release loses momentum, 
but her family refuses to give up on the struggle for her release. To politics now, the ruling of Progressive Congress APC has today began the screening of its governorship, senatorial and House of Representatives aspirants in Abuja. Inaugurating the committee, the deputy national chairman north of the party charged the committee to ensure quality aspirants emerge from the process. I would like to, at this point, plead with you to be patient, screen thoroughly, so that we can have the best of the best. We have been very fortunate as a party that we have produced the best there is. Meanwhile, aspirants for the House of Representatives of the APC were screened at the Zeus Paradise Hotel, while screening for senatorial and governorship aspirants took place at the Fraser Suites, located at the Central Business District. Now, those inaugurated today are Senators Tokumbo Afikuyomi, Larry Tejo Osho, Nuruddin Abatemi, Ifain Ararume, Ayogwezi, Abubakar Sondangi, and Joy Emodi. Others are Sam Sam Jaja, Insima Ekeri, and Musa Ibitu. The Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, says he has not resigned but has stepped down his ambition to contest for the 2023 Kebi State Governorship election. In a statement issued in Abuja, it reads that Mr. Malami has the right to choose to shelve his governorship ambition as it's a matter of personal conviction and individual rights which does not violate any law. The statement adds that as individual Nigerian citizens with fundamental rights, we are not aware of any legal, justifiable and reasonable obligations compelling the person of Abubakar Malami, SAN, or as an Attorney General of the Federation, to do otherwise. According to the statement, his decision is a demonstration of patriotism. Another person insisting that he has not yet resigned is Senator Chris Ngege. He has dismissed the claim by Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, that the Honorable Minister of Labor and Employment withdrew his resignation letter after the validatory session with President Muhammadu Buhari in the nation's capital, Abuja. A statement issued by his media office in the nation's capital this evening noted that the minister neither wrote nor submitted a resignation letter to the president. According to the statement, Dr. Ngige's attendance of the validatory session did not mean that he had, in fact, resigned his appointment. In part two, after the break, delete or not to delete section 84, subsection 12 of the Electoral Act 2022. We get a legal perspective as we talk to Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Ulukayo De Enito. That's in a moment. Join us again. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Calm returns to Sokoto Metropolis as Governor Aminu Tambua orders 24-hour curfew following Muslim youth's protest for the release of two arrested in connection with the killing of a female student for alleged blasphemy. Catholic Archbishop of Sokoto Matthew Puka confirms he is unhurt and safe, calls for calm and cancels all masses till curfew is lifted. Family asks for release of Leah Sharibu as she clocks 19 in captivity four years and two months after the Boko Haram terrorist group abducted her and her colleague students from the Government Girls Science and Technical College, Dapchi Yobe State. Mayor says Ukrainian forces have pushed Russian troops far from Ukraine's second largest city.
A presidential aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, Mr. Mohamed Hayatuddin and Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State, has decried the level of insecurity and lack of value for human life in the country, emphasizing the need to vote the PDP to change the narrative. Both parties made the call when Mr. Hayatuddin paid a visit to Governor Otom and party delegates in Benue State. For Governor Tom, any aspirant who demonstrates the capacity to check the insecurity in the country will get the support of the people. From northern Nigeria to the south, insecurity has become a threat to human lives, property and businesses and a cause of worry for all. This and many more are some of the concerns of presidential aspirants of the People's Democratic Party who have made it a talking point in various consultations across the country while suggesting solutions if elected in 2023. One of the aspirants, Mr. Mohamed Hayatuddin and his team are in Benue State to woo party delegates and assure them of his plans to put an end to security and economic challenges. Nigeria has so much going for it that if we can unite ourselves, we can get things going and get this country moving in the right direction. The economic system is broken. I'm a mechanic, I'm a carpenter. I have a rich history of transforming sick institutions. Nigeria can be fixed and I'll fix it in all spheres of the economy. The burden of selecting a presidential candidate lies with the delegates who are concerned about how much priority is given to rescuing Nigeria. If you know what is happening today in Nigeria, Abuja today, the queue for queue has come back. Everywhere, the security situation is zero. But if you want hope, and if you want this country to be rescued, then you must believe in PDP. Their next port of call is the Benue State Government House, where they are received by Governor Samuel Otom. The governor gives his stance on the idea of zoning and makes it clear that any aspirant who demonstrates the will to address insecurity will be backed. For the purpose of this election in 2023, let all of you who have indicated interest go in and solicit votes from the delegates as we are doing today. And at the end, anyone who is uh, nominated, we shall back him up. The presidential primary of the People's Democratic Party is scheduled to hold on the 28th and 29th of May 2022, when all aspirants will compete for the ticket and the winner will square off against the opposition at the 2023 elections. Another person who is eyeing the nation's top job is former Senate President Dr. Bukola Saraki, who says an imperative for Nigerians to choose carefully the right person to pull the country out of the current challenges. And the best options, according to him, are from the People's Democratic Party PDP. Dr. Saraki, who is one of the contenders for the PDP presidential ticket in the next election, adds that it's also important to choose someone who has lots of experience in administration, likening himself with the background of the legislature. The PDP presidential aspirant was speaking after a closed-door meeting with the governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, at his residence in Benin City, the state capital. We know the problem of this country. We know that this country needs to be rescued and we need to be fixed. We don't have the luxury of just voting anybody this time, 2023, because of the situation the country is. The country needs leaders that understand the issues. So we are, we've been talking and we all agree that that is what this country needs. PDP is the only party today that can give the right direction for this country. So we must make sure that, yes, there are a lot of, qualify, a lot of aspirants who are looking to be president, but I believe that some are more qualified than others, experience on the executive arm of government and also on the legislative and understand. You've got to know, understand how business works because you know how executive works and you know how the legislative operates so it can work together and unite this country. So these are the things we're talking about. And, and as you know, he's a key stakeholder in this, in this party, in this country, because he understands the issues. You know, and that's the fact. He knows what he's talking about. He has an idea what Nigeria needs. And so what he thinks is very, very important for aspirants like us so I've had a good discussion, um, private discussion. I'm going now to go and 
talk to the delegates and let them know why they need to vote for me in the primaries coming up on the 28th. Capacity to deal with Nigeria's current challenges as well as experience in governance, these are some of the attributes presidential aspirants of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, are showcasing to delegates as they lobby for their votes ahead of the May 28th and 29th party primaries. Some of the aspirants who met separately with PDP delegates in Abuja appeal to them to think beyond the party's primaries and to give their votes to someone who can win the 2023 presidential elections for the party. They argue strongly that electorates will only cast their votes for candidates who have the capacity to address the country's numerous challenges, especially insecurity and economic hardship. It's exactly two weeks to the presidential primaries of the People's Democratic Party, and some of the aspirants seem to believe in no stone unturned as they intensely woo delegates for their support. We feel challenged that no. This Fifteen presidential aspirants are expected to participate in the contest to choose a candidate that will fly the PDP presidential flag in 2023. Some of the contestants want delegates to consider the experience and capacity of the aspirants to maximize the country's economic potential before casting their votes. If we wake up every morning and start looking at the problems and be crying over it, nothing will happen. If we keep saying, oh, there's a cast, no, not at all. What we have is all that we need to take this country back to where the only thing that we need to put in perspective is your vote on May 29. Or what do you need to vote? Udom Emmanuel. That's all. Once you vote Udom Emmanuel, you rescue Nigeria, you restore Nigeria. Economy, infrastructure, and everything. You and I know that I will not learn on the job. I have had experiences that are cognate on the job. I have had exposures that are appropriate on the job and I have acquired knowledge and competence that are most suited for the job. Every PDP presidential aspirant who has met with delegates has advocated for one reason or the other to be given the chance to fly the party's presidential flag. No doubt the contest for the presidential ticket is intense. But it's far more competitive in the main election, where the choice of who becomes the president of the country would be determined by voters across party lines. This is the reason why some of the aspirants want delegates to look beyond the party primaries. Fifteen presidential aspirants are in the race, but in the end, only one candidate will emerge to represent the party at the 2023 presidential elections. Analysts say the choice of the candidate will have a direct impact on the party's performance at the polls. Still on the 2023 presidential race, businessman Mr. Tieni Jack Rish has joined the race for the presidential elections under the platform of the All Progressive Congress, APC. He declared his intention to contest in the election in Abuja, where he promised to improve the nation's economy through youth empowerment, improvement of foreign direct investment, and agricultural development, that if he gets the job. According to him, he intends to create about 26,000 jobs across the 774 local government areas of the country on his first day in office. The man of the moment, Tien Jack Rich, arrives at the Congress Hall of the Transcap Hilton Hotel in the company of members of his campaign organization. Tien Jack Rich is the founder and president of Belema Oil Producing Limited. The director general of the campaign organization and former governor of Bochi State, Isa Yuguda, is the first to speak. He states reason why Tien Jack Rich is a man for the job come 2023, following his track record in the oil and gas industry. All the candidates you are talking about today, they can only talk about the problems of Nigeria. He's the only person that I've seen with the template on how to turn around your economy, for goodness sake. It's time for the presidential aspirants to speak. He talks about his humble beginnings and how his experiences galvanized him for greatness. I was helping my mom, you know, try to hawk around, but then she took ill. And I didn't know where my father was. To cut a long sort of show, this woman couldn't afford a medical bill. And in my very eyes, I lost her. When I lost her, life became so tough. I didn't know what to do. I had to retire back to the village of 
you know, trying to fish as a little boy and all those type of stuff, trying to make ends meet. Key areas of focus for Mr. Tien Jack Rich is reflating the economy through youth empowerment, industrial development, and boosting oil and non-oil exports. We will create 26,000 jobs in every local government area. In my, first, in my very first day in office, we will train 26,000 boys and girls, women and youths. 26,000 will be trained with 300,000 error each. If you doubt how I'm going to make that happen, you can sit with me off the camera. I'm going to give you the numbers because I know how to do it. Mr. Jack Reach is hopeful that with his official declaration and presentation of his agenda, he will clinch the presidential ticket of the All Progressives Congress when the party holds its primary soon. Let's bring you one more story on the situation in Sokoto State. Former Vice President and Presidential Aspirant under the platform of the People's Democratic Party, Mr. Atiku Abubakar, has been reacting to the deletion of the posts put up on his social media handles condemning the mob action on Ms. Deborah Samuel. He told journalists after a meeting with the Edo State Governor, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, on his presidential ambition that the controversial tweet and message on his Facebook page was pulled down because it did not have his consent. The message posted on his verified pages, both on Twitter and Facebook, says there can be no justification for such gruesome murder and all those behind her death must be brought to justice. My condolences to her family and friends. Every tweet has to get my approval. Unfortunately, this tweet, because I was traveling all over the country, did not have my approval. So I said it should be taken out and that every tweet must have my express approval. I am not a person who is afraid to take stand on issues. You know the stand I took on Sharia. I was pelted, I was abused in the north. But then how long did the Sharia last? I told them they were having a political Sharia. And I was vilified. I, they thrown stones at me. There is nothing they did not do. That did not make me change, you know, my position as far as Sharia is concerned. But where is the Sharia today? So the only thing that went wrong with that tweet was that it was not authorized by me. The First Lady, Mrs. Aisha Buhari, has asked the All Progressive Congress, APC, not to grant free nomination forms as a strategy to relegate or sideline aspiring women from attaining higher elective positions. Addressing APC female aspirants who converge on the State House of Abuja, Mrs. Buhari acknowledged the courage of all the over 700 female aspirants vying for various elective positions across the country, and she reaffirms her support. I don't want the party to use giving the free forms as a means of sidelining women at the end of the day. believe in free gifts. I don't believe in free gifts. I don't believe in free gifts. But with Dr. Betty there as our leader, I believe that the APC will never really get women at the back seat at the end of the events. We must solidify our unity of purpose and work hard towards creating an impactful space within the political arena. To legal matters now, many people argue that the Court of Appeal judgment has not laid to rest the controversy surrounding the provision of Section 84, subsection 12 of the Electoral Act 2022. In fact, depending on who you are listening to, lawyers themselves are given conflicting interpretations on the judgment on the section, that's Section 84, subsection 12. In this next report, our judiciary correspondent Shola Shuele attempts an analysis of that judgment. <laughs> On April 7, a three-member panel of the Appeal Court led by Justice Rita Pemu 
granted the People's Democratic Party, PDP, permission to file a suit as an interested party against the March 18 judgment of the Federal High Court, Umuahia, Abia State. The Abia Court, presided over by Justice Evelyn Ayadike, had ordered the Attorney General of the Federation to delete Section 84, Subsection 12 of the Electoral Act. Justice Anyadike delivered the judgment in a suit filed by a lawyer and member of Action Alliance, Unduka Edede. Dissatisfied with the decision ordering the deletion of the section, the PDP approached the Court of Appeal, which subsequently granted an accelerated hearing of the suit. The Court of Appeal has now agreed with the PDP and held that the Abia Court lacked the jurisdiction to hear the suits as the plaintiff lacked the legal standing to have filed the case. The court subsequently set aside the judgment of the Abia courts, and the implication of this is that to the mind of the Court of Appeal, Section 84, Subsection 12 will not be deleted, as it remains the law until it is set aside by the Supreme Court. Even though the live issue was on jurisdiction, the appeal court went a step further to determine the case on its merit. And this is where it gets interesting and perhaps confusing. The appeal court said if it were to decide the case on its merit, Section 84, Subsection 12 would be unconstitutional because it is in conflict with Section 42, Subsection 1A of the Constitution, which would deny the political appointees their right to participate in the elections. The implication of this is that the Court of Appeal believes that if the suit had been properly filed by a person who had the requisite locus, Section 84, Subsection 12 would amount to a bad law on grounds of discrimination. Some people argue that this decision on the merit is an academic exercise. Others fault the reasoning of the court, arguing that Section 42, Subsection 1A is not absolute, and the point especially to the proviso or exceptions, if you like, in Subsection 3. Make of that what you will, but what is clear for now is that the directive of the president for ministers with political ambitions to resign is in line with the intent of the lawmakers, which seeks to create a level playing field for all candidates at the polls. Shola Shoyeli, Channels Television News. To further discuss this, we're being joined by Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Ulukayo De Enito. A pleasure having you with us on Thanks. the News at 10. Nice uh, having me. Thank you. Now, where do those who have been affected by the various provisions stand today in the eyes of the law? Well, you see, the decision of the Court of Appeal, it's clear, it's simple. It says, one, the individual who went to court lacked standing. As such, the suit was struck out. Now, as they are meant to do, it was an originating summons. When an originating summons is brought, all the facts have been argued. The uh, legal arguments have also been properly stated. The court is enjoined. Even when it says, oh, the lower court lacks jurisdiction, it will still give a decision on the merit to save time, which is what they did here. Now, this judgment, of course, there is still a lap to run. The Supreme Court is there. Yes. I see both sides appealing. The appellant would go further to say they were wrong in what they have said on the merits. What have they said? That section 8412 conflicts with section uh, 142. Now, on what basis did they arrive at that conclusion? The second respondent, who is the Attorney General of the Federation, who was a defendant in the lower court, filed a respondent notice now, a respondent's notice is provided for under Order 9 of the Court of Appeal Rules. That order specifically is made for the person who won in the lower court. Okay. You won in the lower court. The person who lost has now appealed. You are asking the Court of Appeal to 
affirm the lower court's judgment, but not on the grounds the court used. So you're giving the Court of Appeal another reason to say, look, the judgment was right, but it was on these grounds, not on the grounds that they found. In this instance, it was the person who lost in the lower court who is now saying, oh, you know, I found that judgment on this. I'm not aware of how that was arrived at. But would it be correct to say that the law provides separately for civil servants, public servants, and appointed political office holders in this case? Yes. The political office holders are clearly not caught by, um, they are not public servants. That's very clear. The court clearly stated that. The Court of Appeal agreed that they are not public servants, they are not civil servants. However, the court went ahead to say that they are a community of persons who have been discriminated against by that law. Are they a community? They are not. Each of them, have, none of them have been discriminated against, in my view. All they needed to do is resign. No one says you cannot contest. Okay. All the Section 8412 is saying is if you want to contest, you are free. These are the conditions. You cannot be holding political office and at the same time be a delegate voting or seeking votes. But quickly now, since there is still room, the possibility that they will move to the Supreme Court, yes. you know, doesn't that leave an uncertainty? No, that, right now, the decision is that the person who went to court lacks standing. Okay. What is the judgment as of today? It is that Section 8412 is valid because there is actually no decision on it. Remember, the Court of Appeal has struck out the suit, so there is no suit. The decision on, oh, in case we are wrong and the court has judgment, that is not going to be what will be held until the Supreme Court says, oh, yes, we agree, or we disagree. Sorry. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Ulukayo de Enito, a pleasure sharing your thoughts Thank with you, us. Thank you, Melinda. On the news at 10. So are the stories now. The chairman of the Association of Nigerian Development Finance Institution, Mr. Ulukayo de Piton, is calling for more collaboration amongst development finance institutions to tackle some of the economic challenges facing the country. Speaking at the opening session of the Second Assembly of Development Finance Institutions, the chairman of the association, who is also the managing director of the Bank of Industry, describes the role of development finance institution as key towards achieving and addressing challenges of poverty and unemployment. It's the second annual Association of Nigerian Development Finance Institutions General Assembly. The forum is bringing together heads of development finance institutions at the federal and state levels to discuss how innovative financing schemes can enhance shared growth and development. <laughs> The managing director of the Bank of Industry, Olukayo de Piton, who chairs the assembly, notes with concern a World Bank report which predicts that Nigeria would be home to 95.1 million poor people before the end of 2022. The actions of all of us at this event shall have a significant input to determining whether the growth of Nigerians' population will promote prosperity and improve the livelihood of the Nigerian people or become a source of fragility, social tension, and increased economic hardships. So let's, uh, unveil After his speech, yeah. the new logo for the association is then launched. Speaker after speaker highlights some of the innovative financing models adopted by their institutions to create employment. As at, uh, last month, the 
onboarded about 12 financial institutions that they can lend through, up to 12 of them. Uh, loans they've guaranteed, over 11,000 loans they've guaranteed to micro, small, and medium enterprises. And the volume of those loans is about 91 billion. Nigeria and indeed Africa are in dire need of financing to cushion the effects of the challenges that come with a growing population, namely unemployment, youth restiveness and poverty. Areas such as agriculture, industries and the service sectors are seen as key catalysts for addressing these challenges. For us to mobilize the so much funding that is required to support, to finance the SDGs and our national development plans and now the post-COVID-19 world, then we have to find innovative ways and innovative solutions and development banks are one of the key instruments. While the federal government continues to stress on the need to finance the activities of small and large businesses, collaborations from members of development finance institutions and members of the private sector will help give a boost towards achieving the much-needed socio-economic development which the country desires. And to some entertainment news now, filmmakers and other industry practitioners turn up to celebrate the nominees of the eighth installment of the Amsel Malta sponsored African Magic Viewers Choice Awards in Lagos. The nominees gala is the penultimate event in the eight day lineup of events, which culminates in awards handing out ceremony. It's the night before the D-Day of the Amstel Malta African Magic Viewers' Choice Awards and nominees, industry practitioners and select fans are treated to an informal party. A totally unscripted event where no directors shouting for second takes, gaffers and DOPs looking for right angles, just filmmakers having fun. It's beautiful because we need to look for something every year. And if you just work, work, and you can't, you can't see the um, result of your hard work, that's being recognized in my fall flat. So, something I've looked forward to every single year to put it the MVC for this. In an earlier statement from the title sponsors, the acting portfolio manager for non alcoholic drinks, Nigerian Breweries PLC, Eloho Lumideawe, stressed that Amstel Malta's core objective of headlining the AMVCA is to consistently build bridges and enable opportunities for the most active segment of Africa's ever growing population, which is evident in Nigeria's Nollywood. Whoever is following Nollywood will know that Nollywood 15 years or 10 years ago is not the same Nollywood now. It has grown, it's better. We have a lot of uh, partnership with international communities. Streaming platforms are flooding into Nigeria, Netflix, Amazon, name them. And we, we just keep getting bigger. And not being part of what we're doing is actually losing now, to be very honest. Nollywoods get into the AMVCA race, dominating all categories, some even having only Nigerian nominees. Veteran Clarion Chukura believes this is a result of years of hard work. African film industry, you know, was very limited to a few films, you know, annually until Nollywood came with the home video industry. Now the home video industry enabled um, Africa to have a paying industry that enabled us to have practitioners who can say that they make their living from making movies. The African Magic Viewers Choice Awards rewards excellence in filmmaking across Africa. Now let's find out what's happening in the world of business with Teniola Shobowali. Thanks for watching Melinda. Welcome to Business News. The executive director of the Nigeria Export Promotion Council, Ezra Yakuzak, has announced the approval of 375 billion naira export expansion grants to 285 exporters by the Federal Executive Council. The latest intervention by the federal government, which aims to improve uh, at improving non-oil export, covers the period of 2006 to date. Speaking with reporters after a walkout session on export survival, which held in Abuja. The NEPC boss also highlights other policies adopted by the council to boost non-oil export. 
and we are going to bring up more initiatives. For example, from Natural Conference, we are about to set up a project called Exporters Handholding. What we intend to do is to pick up new exporters. They've, they've just recently started, they don't have an idea of what it is to export. We are going to match them, match make them with all exporters to train them on the fiscal aspect of non-oil export, on what to do, the rudiments, the procedures, fiscal I, I, I procedures to ensure that they export. So that's part of the things we are doing. Well, I and I need to mention this, I need to mention this, that it's like the federal government also in, uh, in, 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 in to boost non-oil export, the Federal Executive Council just approved the sum of 375 billion naira, yeah, as, a, as export expansion grant to all exporters that apply for export expansion grant, and that means the backlog from 2006 to date has been cleared, and, and and so exporters will expect that any month from now, 375 billion naira approved. Uh, for the export expansion grant by the Federal Executive Council. Right now, it is going to be taken to the National Assembly for assent. And of course, about 285 exporters are beneficiaries of, of that EEG as of now. Trading activity at the FMDQ exchange was negative this week as the total turnover of transactions carried out at the FX spot forwards and futures markets fell by 56.58% to $409.36 million as at May the 6th. A further analysis, uh, that's May the 13th. A further analysis of trade and results shows that total value of transactions at the FX spot markets, that's the INE window, increased by 120 12.59% to $644.36 million, while the FX derivatives market turnover jumped by 181.97% to $299.62 million. Well, from there, we move to the equities market, which ended the second week of May with a hangover of positive sentiments, which had dominated the previous weeks. The market's benchmark performance indicators climbed higher into the 53,000 level after gaining 2.45% week to date at the close of Friday's trading session amid sustained buy interest on the part of local investors. At the same time, the total value of equities on the NGX climbed higher into the 28 trillion naira mark amid gains from key components across four out of the five key sectors of the market. And as business news tonight, I'm Tenyor Lashabo Ale. It's back to Melinda for the rest of the news at 10. Hey, thanks, Tenyor La. On the international scene, in a victory for Ukraine, the mayor of Kharkiv says Russian troops have been firmly forced back from the northeastern city near the Russian border. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second largest city and before the war was home to an estimated 1.4 million people. According to officials, residents have started to returning to the city to deal with the destruction left in the wake of the battle. Here's more update from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 80 days since the invasion began, and in a sign of the price Russia may be paying for its offensive, servicemen near Kiev have been seen loading hundreds of bodies of Russian soldiers into refrigerated rail cars. According to Ukrainian officials, the bodies were collected after fighting in the Kiev and Chenihiv regions. There are currently no reliable estimates of Russia's losses in the war. Meanwhile, Russian forces have been driven away from the second largest city of Kharkiv, though nearby villages continue to be bombarded. Capturing Kharkiv was a key Russian objective. The northeastern city is only about 50 kilometers from the Russian border and not too far from the Donbass region that is home to pro-Russia separatist groups fighting on Russia's side in the war. Moscow's most tangible success in what it calls a special military operation has been to capture territory along the southern coast, linking the Crimean Peninsula with Donbass. In the port city Mariupol, Russian troops are still trying to extinguish the last Ukrainian stronghold in the giant Azovstal steelworks. In other developments, NATO foreign ministers have met in Germany 
while Finland and Sweden make moves to join the U.S.-led military alliance. Finland has told Russian President Vladimir Putin that the Nordic country will decide to seek NATO membership in the next few days. Well, our president called to Vladimir Putin uh, for the reason that he wanted to inform Russia where Finland is going now with the NATO application process and what is the current status and, and so forth. And I understand that Russia took note on, on this announcement. Our parliament will discuss this item on Monday and it's very likely that there is a very strong majority in our parliament also supporting the NATO membership and then we will issue the application during the coming week. Responding to Finland's bid to join NATO, the Russian president says it would be a mistake that could damage relations between the two countries. Russia's long threatened consequences if its nearby neighbors join NATO, a Western military alliance founded in part to ward off threats from the Soviet Union in 1949. In India, at least 27 people have been killed and others are missing after a fire swept through a four-story building in Delhi. More than 70 people were inside when the fire started and witnesses say some jumped out of the window to escape. Women make up the majority of the office workers. A short circuit is thought to have started the blaze. According to authorities, Two brothers who own the CCTV manufacturing company, which is housed in the building, have been arrested in connection with the incident. Police are also seeking to talk to the owner of the building. And Chris Elms is standing by to give us the latest from the world of sports. Welcome to Sports News. Liverpool have won their second title of the season after beating Chelsea 6-5 on penalty to lift the FA Cup final at Wembley Stadium. After a goal less 120 minutes, it was yet another penalty shootout between the teams that also contested the Carabao Cup final, with the Reds winning 11-10 in February. Costa Simicas was the unlikely hero for Liverpool as he converted from the sport after Alison Becker saved Mouse, Mason Mount's penalty kick. Chelsea have now lost three successive FA Cup finals at Wembley. So, Perry goes forward. Tao Awuni is called a brace as Union Berlin claimed a 3 2 win over Bochum in their last Bundesliga game to secure a Europa League spot for next season. After Griska Promes scored the opening goal of the match in the fifth minute in favor of Berlin, Awuniyi added the second in the 25th minute and scored the vital goal in the 88th minute. Union Berlin ended the season with 57 points from 34 matches. For Awuniyi, his brace ensured he finished sixth in the Bundesliga goal scorer chart with 15 goals this season. Well, number one, Novak Djokovic is through to the final of the Italian Open. Djokovic defeated Kasper Ruud 6-4, 6-3 for a landmark 1,000th uh, win in an hour 42 minutes. The Serbian becomes the fifth man in the Open era to reach the milestone. Joining Jimmy Connon, Roger Federer, Ivan Lendl and Rafael Nadal. The victory puts him through to his fourth straight final and 12th overall in the Italian capital. He will seek a record extending 38th ATP Masters 1000 title in Sunday's final against Stefano Sissipas. That's Post News. I'm Chris Lems. Back to you, Malinda. Many thanks, Chris. And the main news again. Calm returns to Sokoto Metropolis today as Governor Aminu Tambua orders 24-hour curfew following Muslim youth protests for the release of two arrested in connection with the killing of a female student for alleged blasphemy. Also today, Catholic Archbishop of Sokoto Diocese, Matthew Kuka, confirms he is unhurt and safe, calls for calm and cancels all masses till curfew is lifted. And mayor of Kharkiv says Ukrainian forces have pushed Russian troops far from Ukraine's second largest city. That's the news at 10 tonight. I'm Melinda Akinami on behalf of the team. Good night.